<laughs> That's great. Um, so let, let's move to, to some of the, the connections to Texas here. We're in Texas, and uh, um, so one of your earlier deals was, it was the IPO of Ross Perot's EDS. First deal. First deal, um, <laughs> first IPO. And um, there's some great passages in the book about, about that, that, that episode. So tell us a little bit about your relationship with Ross and, and, and that experience. Well, he, no doubt about it, Perot put me on the map. But let me give you a little perspective. When I met with Ross, EDS was doing $7 million a year in business. He had 323 employees. Um, I'd heard about the company, and I got an appointment to see him. And the bottom line was that after our meeting, which lasted all of 30, well, it was supposed to last 30 minutes, I was told, you got a meeting with him, you got 30 minutes, and don't swear. Now, 30 minutes would have been less of a problem than the second condition. But, <laughs> so anyway, um, I show up, and sure enough, exactly at 11.30, that's the time for the meeting. And for 29 and a half minutes, Ross is telling me everything. And by the way, everybody on Wall Street wanted his deal. Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Lee Higgins, and GE. There was a lot of firms that they're all gone now. And he, so for 29 and a half minutes, this guy told me this, that guy told me that, blah, 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 blah. And he said, well, what do you think? And I'm looking at my watch, I got 30 seconds. I'm like, well, Mr. Perot, uh, maybe another time you can see me, because Jack Height told me I got 30 minutes, and it's about, time's about up. He said, no, 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 tell me what you think. And I think, well, I'm going to blow the 30-minute rule. Why not go for the whole enchilada? I said, Mr. Perot, that's the biggest pile of horse blank I've ever heard in my life. We talked for 13 hours. One o'clock the next morning, he's driving me around Texas to find a drugstore where I could buy, because I was going to go back to New York that afternoon, three o'clock plane. And he was looking for a place where I could buy a toothbrush, a T-shirt, you know, I, I had nothing with me. And he called me up the next day, which is a Thursday, and he said to me, uh, I'm glad we met. I, I, I'm in no rush. I want to put this off for a while, and let's get to know each other better. And over time, we got to know each other better. And, he blessed me with his deal, and I think we redeemed ourselves very well by the way we did the deal. And one funny story, uh, when you bring a company publicly, it's something called a prospectus. It's the document that potential investors get to tell you all about what's going on. And um, he said to me, uh, about a second or third meeting, well, do me a favor, he said, uh, will you bring down some of those prospecti from your other deals? And I said, okay. I had one problem, there were none. So I was hoping he'd forget. So I, and by the way, every time I went to see him, he picked me up at the airport, and it was Love Field, and they didn't have DFW. He'd pick me up and take me back to the plane himself. So we had the meeting, and I'm in the car driving back to the airport, and I'm breathing a sigh of relief because he hasn't brought up the prospectus, the prospecti, and uh, he, I get, I'm ready to get out of the front seat of the car. And he says, by the way, did you bring those prospecti? And I said, no, sir. <laughs> Forget them. I said, no, sir. There are none. And he looked at me, and he went back, and I said, you're it. He said, what do you mean? I said, you're the first deal I will have ever done. But I said, let me tell you, there's more risk for me. You've got a great company. Nobody can screw this deal up. But if I do the job I'd like to do, it's going to enhance me, and you're going to be no worse off. And he, he bought into it, and as they say, the rest is history. And he, 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 I wish he'd have been president of the United States. I really wish it in the worst way he would have been president. Much of what's going on in America today, he was talking about 27 years ago. Go back and look, the deficit, the sucking sound. Remember the big giant sucking sound from down south, NAFTA? Uh, the loss of jobs in America, the loss of manufacturing. He, this was all 1992 campaign talk. Go back and see it. He was there. And uh, uh, a good man, really a good man. Great American. Texas has got to feel awfully proud to have a guy like that. And I'm sure you do. I like the joke play on him driving through the Hall of Tunnel. Oh. Uh, <laughs> he, he, was, he loved to play games. He loved to, he had a great, he has a great sense of humor. And I agreed to take it public at 100 times earnings, which was absolutely unheard of. Now, 
Where did I get 100 times earnings from? I don't know, it was just a round number. <laughs> the average idea, price idea, was 30 times. The next highest one was a firm called G.H. Walker. And he called me up and he said, all these guys are telling me you won't get it done at 100 times earnings. I said, Ross, I'm telling you, I'll get it done. He called me back, he said, well, Jerry Lodge, who was at G.H. Walker, Jerry Lodge is a friend of his. He said, they'll go up at 100 times earnings too. How about a joint deal? And I said, Ross, let me tell you about 100 times earnings. Put me in a racing car with a steering wheel and the gas, and I put you next to me with the brakes. I guarantee you one thing, at 200 miles an hour, neither one of us are gonna get out of the car alive. If you wanna give them the deal, you go right ahead, no hard feelings. No, no, you came there first. I said, fine, but if you want to give it to them. And he said, no, no, and he said, you got the deal. So now, New York had a, state, a transfer tax on sales of stocks, so what we used to do was we would go through the tunnel to New Jersey right after midnight on the day the deal's gonna come and sign all the documents there so the transaction took place in Jersey, not in New York. That night, the night before the underwriting, Margo and Ross and Elaine and I were having dinner at 21, and Elaine had to go home because we had three little boys for school the next day. And Ross and Margo and I drove through the tunnel to sign all these papers. And as we're driving through the tunnel, now we're in a, we're in a limousine where the back seats look at each other. So Ross and Margo are looking forward, and I'm sitting with my back to the driver looking at them. And we're going through the Holland Tunnel. And he said, well, I suppose this is when you tell me I'm not getting 100 times earnings. I said, that's right. See, Margo, they're all alike up here. They don't understand down in Texas when you put your hand out, you're worried you're bond. Margo, I'm telling you, they all warned me this was going to happen. And he was, he was kind of exercised. And I, I winked at Margo. She caught the wink. Great lady. Oh, what a wonderful lady. And... Uh, so she said, well, wait a minute, Ross, relax. She said, well, I said, wait a minute, Ross. You want 100 times earnings? She said, I, you got it. Damn right, I got it. That was our deal. I said, okay, okay. You want 100 times earnings? You got it. So Margo then says, okay, Ken, what were you going to do with that? I said, well, I was going to do it at 115 times earnings, but this is only one of the 100 times earnings. It's okay with me. <laughs> we did it at 115 times earnings, by the way. And it was a phenomenal success. So, big break in my life. And again, somebody else who was a big part of whatever happened to me, Ross and Margo, and all those wonderful people at EDS. Let's fast forward a few years and let's get to Home Depot. And uh, yeah. uh, one of the, 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 the segments of the book you tell is about how you see the Handy Dance store in Houston. Mm -hmm. They got you excited about the idea mm -hmm. and you saw the value of that company. And well, I don't, I, by the time this episode in Houston took place, I owned. 16% of the company, and it was a it was 81% owned by a company in California called Dalen. <clears throat> we own, they took it public, so nine, the public owned 19% of the stock. Me and my group owned 16, and the 3%, the remaining 3% was owned by an order of redemptorist priest in Brooklyn, who I tried to buy the stock from. And, a guy's name was Ray McCarthy, a very heavy Irish brogue. And I called him up and I said, Father, I, you own 50,000 shares of Andy Dan and we'd like to buy it. And he said, well, tell me, young man. He said, uh, that name, Italian? I said, yes, sir. Catholic? Yes, sir. He said, under the pain of hell, tell me what I should do. I said, keep the stock, okay? <laughs> I'll take on anybody but not God, okay? So, <laughs> so we... Bernie and I are walking through a new store in Houston, and I'm really excited as all hell. I'm, I can't believe how great this store was. About a 40,000 square foot store, and the customers were loving it and everything. And so Bernie saw how enthusiastic I was, and he said, hey, wait a minute. He was, he was chairman and CEO. He said to me, don't get too excited. He said, because there's something out there that if somebody does it, it's going to wipe out the industry. I said, what is it? What is it? No, I can't tell you. It's so powerful. I don't want anybody to know. Okay. Fast forward a year and a half. 
he and Arthur get fired. I sell my 16 stock, 16% back to this bad guy. He, I warned Bernie when I sold. Bernie wanted me to sell it back to him. I said, okay, I'll do it. I didn't want to do it, but I warned him you're going to get fired. And sure enough, bam, three months after I sold him the stock, Bernie's 49 years old, no job, no health insurance, three children, nothing. And he calls me up and he said, he, he, I got to help him find a job. I said, let's talk about what. It. it was a Saturday afternoon when he called me. I said, well, how soon can you get to New York? He said, tomorrow morning. I can be there tomorrow morning. I think I can take a flight out this afternoon. It was 1 o'clock in L.A. where the company was headquartered. And I said, all right, what did you get fired for? I said, well, we violated some labor law. I said, well, you know a labor lawyer? He says, yeah. I said, well, bring him too. So Sunday morning at 9.30, I meet him at Peacock Alley in the Waldorf Astoria. He looked like death warmed over. I mean, he was just gotten fired on Friday. He looked terrible. And he had this labor lawyer by the name of Jerry Glassman. And we sit down, and no niceties. I turned to Jerry and I said, is he going to jail? And Jerry said, no, he's not going to jail. Bernie, what, what, jail? What are you talking about jail? I said, well, I'm only interested if you're going to go to jail because you can't run a company from jail. He said, what are you talking about? I said, we're going to start a company. He said, what do you mean? I said, you told me that there's something out there that if somebody does it, it's going to obliterate the industry. I said, we're going to do it. Well, are you crazy? I got family. I said, don't worry about it. We're going to do it. And it was his idea, and I never knew what the hell it was until, you know, you talk about buying a pig and a poke. I bought a pig and a poke. But I was convinced that he knew what he was, and he, I was right. I mean, Bernie, Bernie is an incredible, incredible businessman. And of course, the, we changed, we, we destroyed the industry. There's two of us, really, there's Lowe's and there's us. There used to be Rickle, Channel, Pergament, Heckinger's, Scotty's, Payless Cashways, West Lumber, Handy Dan, pick and pay, and they're all gone. And we literally reconfigured the industry. And Bernie was right. And that's how it happened. That was a bet, bet on people. You talk a lot about betting. You know, it's all on habit. people. It's always people. I'll give you an easy example. <clears throat> Kmart, previously Kresge Corporation, starts a chain called Kmart. All kinds of money. All kinds of stores. Kmart's a huge success. There's a little guy in northwest Arkansas by the name of Sam Walton with four Ben Franklin five and dime stores. And he hears about this new store up in Troy, Michigan. He goes up there. He doesn't go up once. He keeps going up back and forth. And he dawns on him, hey, these guys have got a bird's nest on the ground. Now, Kmart, Sears are gone. Walmart in sales is the biggest corporation in the world. An extraordinarily successful company. What was the difference? No patents, no know-how, a retail store. The people. Sam Walton and the people. I submit to you, look at the companies that survive against the ones that don't make it. Think of Eastman Kodak. Eastman Kodak was within what was called the Nifty 50, which these were 50 stocks that you had to own if you wanted to be in the real world. Eastman Kodak is gone. Why? Bad management. Why? They didn't understand that if they didn't do digital photography, somebody else would. Why didn't they do it? Because they wanted to protect the little box of film you had to buy. And you know and I know digital photography, you don't need film. So. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a people junkie. It's all about the people. It always is about the people. And, and you look at IBM. IBM was the, the, the company in America. And Microsoft, IBM gave Microsoft the operating system that became the basis for Microsoft. Look at Microsoft today. It's multiples more valuable than IBM. Multiples. Michael Dell. Same thing, right here. Intel. Intel was founded out of the out of the out of the base of Fairchild Cameron Instrument. So, what what drives? What's the difference? The people. And and don't ever sell that short. They are the difference. You can take all the technology you want. 
But if you haven't got the right people, it doesn't matter. So, so any, any, I'm a people junkie, but I love being around people. I love selling. I, I'm 83. I'm doing the same thing I did when I was 25. And I'm, of course, I don't have to worry about paying the bills anymore. But, you know, then I was doing it to eat. Now I'm doing it to just have some fun. And it's more fun now, by the way. Go ahead. <laughs> So, so let me turn to Wall Street a little bit, yeah. and uh, uh, you were able to break through in a small firm, mm -hmm. butting heads against the big guys, the big mm -hmm. investment banks, some mm -hmm. of which you'll name here that are gone now, mm -hmm. um, and, and you were able to make it. And uh, under the current system we have, are, is the system still able to produce new Canlan Gongs, or, or we're stuck with the big guys now, given the well, this be, concentration that we have It would days? be presumptuous for me to say produce Canlan Gongs. I would rather say as long as there are people who see opportunities. And as long as those people are willing to stick their neck out and take a chance, there will always be opportunities. Right now, I, what breaks my heart are kids thinking everything that's been invented, that needs to be invented, that's been invented, there's no more. Just think of this. In 1939, the life expectancy in America was 59 years old. 39. Roughly 80 years ago. Today it's 77 or 78. We're living longer. We have different needs. To me, the opportunities of addressing the adult, the advanced adult market are staggering. They're staggering. Somebody is going to exploit that market and make a zillion dollars. A lot of people are going to do it. And, and I really think the problem we have, as I see it, is the lack of passion and enthusiasm. You know, I, you got to love what you're doing. I, I got to tell you, whenever a kid comes to see me about career counseling, I tell him one thing. If you're not going to love what you're doing, don't take that job. The worst hell on earth is to wake up and say, oh, my God, I got to go to that job again. But on the other hand, where, you, where, you, where it's fun, where it's exciting, where it's, you can't wait to get at it, good things will happen. Now, you might fail. You know, it all sounds good, Home Depot and Perot and all this. But if you got six months, I can tell you all about my failures, OK? That's how much time I'd need to tell you about all of them. You know, we all, we all go through our ups and downs. And I just think it's, a, it's critical that we understand that the opportunities have never been better than they are right now. Maybe a little more difficult to see or find, but they're there. And I say to a kid, if you're walking off point, is how much you're going to make in your first job? You're foolish. Do I like what I'm going to do? Am I going to enjoy what I'm going to do? Am I my acid test? Are you willing, if you had to pay to go to work and you could afford to pay, would you pay to go to work? If the answer is yes, you got the right job. I can't wait, I, literally, I can't wait to get up every morning because I love what I'm doing. It's got nothing to do with the money. It's got everything to do with fun, having a good time, getting things done, creating things. Sometimes you fail, and okay. Do you have the guts to pick yourself up off the floor and carry on if you don't? Forget it. Don't be an entrepreneur. Don't be a capitalist. Because if you can't bounce, you're, you, well, first time you're down, it's over. So let, let's uh, talk about some, uh, about some bad characters now. <laughs> some bad characters in the book, not necessarily bad characters, but... Uh, oh, uh, I had bad characters. Oh, Elliot oh, Spitzer. I mean, he's I, oh, horrible. There we go. <laughs> he's horrible. Bad? He's, he's, bad would be an improvement for him, okay? <laughs> So, so I was trying to tee up there, but sure. Uh, you got me started, okay? I know, I know. Sandy Sigaloff. Uh, in the book, right? That's right. That's Go ahead. Right. So, what's your question? No, I was going to say, was gonna say that, that, that uh, uh, there's this, this notion that a lot of uh, Wall Street is surrounded by bad, questionably ethical people, and then there's like a perception, or, or again, a, a sort of a, an understanding of that in the, in the world. Well, by the days. way, see, here's and and, and that's that's the, sorry, sorry, that's when the, the characters that come through in the book that. Perhaps you had more uh, negative things to say. Were actually regulators and politicians. Um, there were some some feelings about the well, SEC. There were, you know, uh, twisting uh, arms for settlements, and you, and, you threw and then in, of course AG, the AG's you, office you in New threw York State. Wall Street. Wall Street is a reflection of America. We all know we have bad priests in the Catholic Church. 
We have bad ministers in other faiths. We have bad people in all walks of life. Bad people are a fact of life. Wall Street gets more of a black eye because we're stupid enough to flaunt how well we do. <laughs> you know, and that's kind of dumb. You know, you, to me, you always want to act, my old man used to tell me, you want to act like you're losing when you're winning because people like you better than. But so politicians and, and regulators? That's right. We need regulation in America desperately. We need it, because just think of getting in a car and driving a car with no license, or coming up with a pill that you didn't have to go to the FDA to get approval for before you prescribe it. So regulations are a very important part of our society, and I don't, I don't say regulations are bad. I say the people that sometimes are responsible for administering the regulations are bad. Politicians, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not going to be polite. Uh, the worst people in America run for public office, not the best. Not the best. Now, Perot came close. Perot would have been a hell, in my opinion. I'm sure there's a difference of opinion amongst the people in the room. He'd have been a hell of a president. But why don't people run for public service in America, public office? Because it's like getting in a cesspool. Look at what you subject yourself and your family to. I don't care who you are. We all have a skeleton in our closet. I'm no exception. Thank God I survived it and it's behind me and whatever the hell it was, it is. But that's not the point. The point is that why is it that we have so many crying needs in America and we all know it, public education. Public ed education in America is a disgrace. It's an absolute horrible disgrace. Who suffers the most by poor public education? The people that stand to benefit the most by a good education, the poor people, the me's. I was blessed to go to a public school on Long Island that there was a reasonably well-off community, and they had this little section where I live where the plumbers came from and the cafeteria workers and stuff. And I went to a wonderful school system you got them there today. You got Great Neck, Roslyn, Manhasset, Port Wyatt. These are fabulous schools. Kids go to Yale, Harvard, and everything else. So all public education is not bad. But let me give you a number. The 30 most developed countries on Earth, we spend more money per student than any other of the other 29. In results, we rank 28th out of 30th. Why aren't we doing something about it? You got, you got vested interest there that you can't if you want to. In New York City, we have kids graduating from high school that can't pay us fifth grade math or fifth grade English, reading comprehension, fifth grade. And they're going out with a high school degree, say, hey, I graduated from high school. So I, I, it's unfair for me to be so negative on public officials and elected officials. And I'm sure there are some good ones out there. But I believe that, that if people really want to get something done, they'll put their own selfish interests behind everything else they want to get done. I, that's why I'm passionate. I, I do this every time. How many people agree with me that we should have term limits? Raise your hands. Look, look raise them high. Raise them. Don't be ashamed. Be proud. <laughs> look at them. What? 87% of all Republicans want term limits. 75% of all independents and 67% of all Democrats want term limits. The American people want term limits. Why don't we have them? Because the guys up there don't want you to have them because they wouldn't know how to make a living if they weren't up there doing what they're doing. This is what's wrong, in my opinion, with America. But I don't know how you fix it. But I know when you look at the blunders. And by the way, I, I am not going, let me, let me tell you my feelings about Trump. He's a horrible, horrible human being, okay? That's off the table, okay? No pushback. But damn it, he's getting things done. China has been a problem for 40 years, and nobody has taken them on. Regulation. We have regulations that serve no benefit to anybody except driving the cost of business through the roof. 
the number of regulations that have been pulled back that make us more competitive and nobody pays a price for it. We haven't cut back on the requirement, the stringent requirements of drug approval, but we've done it in a way now that people are going to be able to be more productive and society is going to benefit by it. Again, I, you know, I, I can't believe what the guy, I mean, like taking McCain on last week, the guy's dead, leave him alone. <laughs> but guess what? He came out the week before. He's a, look, Trump is a counterpuncher. A week before, it came out that McCain took the dossier and sent it to the regulators, and Trump finds out that this is in part where this, this whole thing with the Mueller investigation all began with a dossier that was false. And I don't know if you saw Lindsay, I was flying over today, I was watching television. Lindsey Graham is saying, we want to find out. I don't want to get, part, I'm, I'm, let me back off that because <laughs> I'm getting partisan. The point I'm making is we can do better as a society with more inspired and more inspiring leadership. We can do a whole lot better. I don't know how you solve the problem. I don't know how you, certainly I wouldn't want to do it. I can't imagine anybody in their right frame of mind want to do it. It's, it's worthy service and it's doing great things for mankind. But it's, it's, oof, it's ugly. It really is. Think about it. Let's move to some uh, more positive things. Hey, if anybody's got a gun, I know you can carry a gun in Texas. Don't shoot me, okay? <laughs> I'll be out of here in two hours. I'll be back in Palm Beach, okay? Uh, let's, let's, let's move to, 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 to your... So they'll do something to me over there. Go ahead. Let's move to your philanthropy. And, uh, yeah, sure. Um, you've been incredibly generous, not only financially, but also with your time and efforts yeah. and a lot of different, different things. And, yeah. Uh, um, share with us some, some of your favorite stories, I guess, and in particular your, chair, your time as a chairman as the NYU Medical School, now the NYU well, Langone Medical Center. Uh, people have asked me that I think I had another Home Depot in me. And you go back 20 years and I said, absolutely not. How, how could there be another one? I was wrong. I was absolutely wrong. This medical center was literally on its butt 20 years ago. And it's flying now. It's incredible what's happened. It's one of the most respected, thought of healthcare facilities in the world, academic, research, you name it. And what did I do? Believe it or not, the same fundamental principles that we did at Home Depot, I did at the medical center. Meetings with the doctors, meetings with the nurses, telling them, First meeting I ever had is I'm going to make you one promise I can keep. None of you are going to have everything you want, but all of you are going to have more than you have right now. That's it. That's the bar. And what have we done? We've, we've, we've risen dramatically. Not only that, but the quality of care. And, you know, we, we were $2 billion in revenues in 20 years ago, and today we'll be $10 billion in revenues. Uh, it's been a dream come true for me. And, and Elaine and I, God bless my bride, one little funny story. In, in 99, when, we, when I got involved, and I said, we ought to make a meaningful gift. She said, okay. And I said, I suggested a nine-figure gift. And she looked at me, she said, we have that kind of money? I said, yeah, I think we're gonna handle it, okay. Uh, I can't tell you the satisfaction I derived from that. Far more, as much as I love Home Depot or EDS or anything else, the satisfaction I derive from that, I can't describe in appropriate words. It's uh, the same is true with Ronald McDonald House. The same is true with my wife and the Boys Club in New York or my charter school in Harlem. You know, yeah, it's all well and good to be successful and make money and have all the appurtenances and all the bells and whistles that come with it. But there's something special and unique, in my opinion about giving back to the extent you can. Now, let me say this to you. When I gave Bucknell its first money, and by the way, <clears throat> in the book, the first chapter is, I owe Bucknell $300. I got married with one semester to go, with two semesters to go, and I went to see the dean, and I said, unless I can take two semesters in one, I'm leaving now, because <coughs> I won't have enough money. My father was very upset that I was getting married, and he felt like you take a wife, she's yours, and he said, I'm gonna give you, uh, it was only 2,500 bucks a year to go to Bucknell, and, and he said, I'm gonna give you the same money I gave you, which wasn't, he didn't have much, and it wasn't much. 
and you got to make it on your own. I said, okay. So I went to buy. It was all right. I covered everything except I was short 300 bucks. So I went to see the dean about taking two semesters in one. And he said, after much discussion, he said, okay, I'll let you do it, but you won't be able to do it. Well, I did. And then on my way out of his office, the, his assistant, who was really his boss, Martha Henderson, her name was, she said to me, how'd you make out? I said, okay, but I got a problem. She said, what's that? She said, um, what's your problem? I said, I need 300 bucks. And he says, we'll figure a way out to help it. So they bucked now loaned me the 300 bucks. And I mean this in my heart of hearts. I don't think I'll ever get over the feeling that I still owe Bucknell $300. Now, I'm not bragging, I'm, I'm proud of this. I'm the biggest donor in the history of the institution. And I still feel I owe them 300 bucks. And I'll tell you why. My old man used to say to me, when somebody does something for you at a point in your life where it's precious, you can never, ever pay them back. All you can do is be grateful for the fact that they did it, but you can never pay them back. And that's how I feel. So philanthropy is a simple thing to me. And this was, again, my father. When I gave Bucknell its first money, which was not a lot now, but it was a lot then, we were having our Sunday lunch with my parents, and Elaine said, tell, tell Pop up what we did for Bucknell. And my father went to the eighth grade, and when I got into Bucknell, this was, this was the be it all and it all for him. His son was going to college. <clears throat> he bought a windbreaker that had Bucknell on the back, and it cost eight bucks. He wore that windbreaker all the time. I mean, that was, he didn't go, but I was going, and boy, he was the cat's meow as far as he was concerned. So we were having a Sunday lunch, and so he said, tell Pop up, and I said, well, I said, Elaine and I made a gift to Bucknell. And, Mom was in the kitchen, the, the Italian woman do, doing all the cooking and getting them. We were all sitting at the table. And Mom came back and sat down. And he said, what'd you do? I says, well, I said, we made a gift to Bucknell. He said, what'd you give up? I didn't give up anything. What are you talking about? What did I give up? He said, yeah, what are you going to go without? I said, nothing. He says, that's not charity. He says, charity is when you go without something for somebody else. Now, in terms of financial resources, there's no way, there's no way I can give up anything that's going to change anything in my life. On the other hand, time. And I'll tell you a fat little thing. We have a, we have a food bank at this community I live in in Florida, and once a year they collect foodstuffs, canned goods for the, for the poor people in, in a community not far from where, where we live. And you go to Publix for 200 bucks, you fill a card up like you couldn't fit another thing in there. I do it myself for one reason. The $200 is meaningless to me. But the 45 minutes to an hour, I could be reading a book, I could be hitting golf balls, which I'm not that good at. He, he, the door was a great golfer. He was a hell of a golfer. So he was, okay, anyway, so it's when you give up something that it's philanthropy, and I plead guilty. I, I, in spite of the enormity of the money we've given away, nothing has changed in my life. Not one. And I'm not sure, by the way, the Bible says, uh, uh, what do they say, a rich man has a better chance of getting into a heaven than a camel getting through the eye of a needle. Well, I plead, I'm not gonna give up what I have, I love what I have. And so therefore, if the Bible's right, I ain't getting to where you wanna go. But, <laughs> but maybe for the time I give, and at this point in my life, it's. 80% of my time is on my charities. And I think that's the right thing to do. And so I, I, I say to all of you, each of you, I don't care what your net worth is, you can be charitable with yourself. And in many respects, that's far more important than cutting a check. Let's bring that back to, to something that uh, we talked about earlier on, your, your concern about the way that you think about the system around us. Uh -huh. And you're passionate about capitalism, you're passionate about your charity, uh -huh. in particular your support to higher education. Uh -huh. Uh, and given the sort of perception of the climate on campuses these days about the negative uh, reactions to capitalism amongst faculty, students, and so on, oh. do, does that any conflict in that? And I mean, NYU in particular is a place where there's a lot of people that would, you know, burn your book down um, Look, if they could. And, and how, do, how, do you, how do you square those two things? 
people are free to burn my book down. They gotta buy it to burn it down, so that's <laughs> only it. I, mean, I hope they burn a lot of them down, you know what I mean? Go out. I hope they really enjoy it. They'll buy 20 and have 20 times of fun. <laughs> by the way, by the way, all the money goes to charity. 100% of it goes to three charities for kids. One is a program I have at Home Depot called Ken's Crew. These are for challenged kids, mostly Down syndrome, autism, stuff like that. And, and Depot's wonderful. When they give them jobs, they pay the same wages they paid everybody else. They need coaches, and that's where the charity comes in. We provide the coaches to help these kids get in the routine. The other is the Boys Club of New York, my wife's charity. And the third is my charter school up in Harlem. Uh, to me, to me, the young people, I know I was young, and I know I thought a lot different then than I do. I think one of the greatest cures to all this is going to be is if these lefties have their way, let the kid go out and get a job, and when he gets his check, he's, oh my God, I made, I made $2,000 this week, but I only got 400 bucks. Where's the other 1,600? Well, you're paying for what you wanted, except you're not getting it. Somebody else is getting it. Capitalism, I, I have no fear that over time, people will come to reality of what do, what's possible. One thing that does bother me, and by the way, if there are professors in this room, I hope I don't give you tight shoes. To me, a college education is all about learning how to think, how to work through thoughts and get things done, whether it's you're an art critic or whether you're a doctor or whatever it is. I am very bothered by the one-sidedness of education in universities today. And there's, there's academic coercion going on. Kids know that if they don't hew to what they're hearing from a professor, it's too frequent for this to happen, and it does happen, that they're gonna be punished by a bad grade. And, I, and I've, I've got something, I'm starting it at Bucknell. It was started at Princeton, it's called, I believe it's the James Madison Institute. And here's the, Princeton requires a thesis to graduate. You gotta write a thesis. A young man wrote a thesis submitted it to his professor. Again, if your professor's here, please, I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm giving you an example of what concerns me. He got a D on the paper. He went to the institute, which has a chapter at Princeton. He went to them and said, they found 22 of the leading scholars in this subject and sent out copies of his thesis to all of them. The lowest grade that came back from these noted and leading scholars in this subject was a B. They went back, and this is unheard of, you know this, professors don't change grades. They went back with these papers and the comments from these professors, and the grade was changed. The guy was called, or it could be a gal, I don't know, the professor was called on, this is wrong, this is wrong. Education should be te teaching people how to think, taking into all sides. Maybe, maybe there's a point of view that's better than mine, but at least let me have the benefit of thinking all sides before I make my mind up. And so this is my concern with higher education in America today. And I, I'm optimistic the greatest cure of all of these kids going out in what I call the real world, and by the way, academia is part of the real world, don't misunderstand me. But these kids going out in the real world and waking up and realizing, hey, there's no promised land. There's no silver bullet. There's no secret thing you put around your neck that makes things good for you. It's hard work, it's passion, it's dedication, and, and hopefully, and I'm appealing to all you kids that are here today, all you students, make sure you allow your mind to think of all sides of an equation before you make your mind up. I don't think that's unfair, and I don't think it's unreasonable. But I think you'll, be, you'll make a better decision if you do. And that's my problem. That's my problem with what's going on in America. I'm optimistic, by the way, about America. I've never been more optimistic than I am right now. Why? Because I see a lot of 
discovery in drugs, better lives, quality. we're living longer, thank God, we're living better lives, we're living more active lives. Think about all the wonderful things. Here I am, 83 years old, I'm probably a little ditzy, and you'll decide that, not me. But here I am, I'm having the time of my life, and I know a lot of people that are doing the same thing. Only in America, that's the other thing. Don't sell America short. This is the greatest country on earth. I, I, this pen, every day I leave my apartment or my home in Long Island, wherever I am, I put the pen on, I look up and I say, Grandma and Grandpa, thanks for coming to America. My grandfather went to the first grade. He left school when he was six years old. Came over here, died at 72, never owned a home, too poor to own a home. But you couldn't deny him the one joy in his life, which was the Memorial Day Parade where he marched with the Sons of Italy in the Memorial Day Parade out in Bowa. I mean, he was so proud to be an American, it was unbelievable. And, and I think if we don't stop beating up on America, shame on all of us. We are, go around the world and ask yourself, I'd, I'd like to take all these kids, you like socialism? Come on, I'll give you a free ride to Caracas, Venezuela. I'm gonna leave you there for a week and I'll come back and get you and then let's talk about which is which, okay? By the way, I'm betting that Texas is still conservative, and I'm in friendly territory here. I, I, mean, I, 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 might, be Austin, getting, I yeah. might be setting myself up for being shot. Okay. Let's open the audience. Uh, sure. See if the audience has questions? Uh, questions to join us. Sure. Yes, ma'am. It's you, Jackie. I thought I got it. No, just loud. Very easy, very easy. If I pay you $9 an hour and you're producing $18 an hour, I make $9. If I pay you $13 an hour and you're making $30 an hour, I make $17. It works, it works, okay? And, and, and not only pay stock, stock saving plan, these 3,000 kids that I'm talking about are multimillionaires today, they started out in a lot. It works. Look, Bernie and Arthur and Pat and I were the four founders. Never owned more than 20% of Home Depot, the four of us together. The rest of the 80% was owned by everybody else. And, and capitalism works. You know, uh, I'm not Gordon Gecko by saying greed is good. Don't misunderstand me. But I am saying there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with wanting to be rich. I've been rich and I've been poor. Rich is better, I can promise you, okay? <laughs> rich is better. Another kid one time grabbed me and he said, you know, you guys, you think money buys happiness. I said, no, it doesn't. I said, try poverty, see how good it does. <laughs> it's an equation of faith. <clears throat> Believing that the more and better I treat you, my fellow that's my driver, I hate to talk about him, Alvaro Gallego, I mentioned him in the book. He's my friend. You can't believe the things that Alvaro does that I don't even ask him to do. So in part, it's a reflection of how you respect somebody. I have a simple belief. When you only give somebody a raise after they ask for it, you gain nothing. But if I call you into my office, I don't have an office, but if I had an office, if I call you into my office and I said, Ann, or, I'm, I'm not good on names, all right? we met for lunch, but uh, I'm giving you a raise. You'll even say, wait, wait a minute, he, he gave me a raise. He knows how good I am. He reflect, I didn't have to ask him. The value of that raise to me is enormous Compared to giving you, because you're going to say, well, if I didn't ask for it, I wouldn't have gotten it. Think of 10 times you can say something positive about somebody and the work they're doing, and one time negative. And make the one time negative a constructive thought. They got to stop, they got to change, but do it in a way that you leave them with their self-respect. The problem I have 
in America today with the welfare system, we're paying a horrible, horrible, not the money. We're stripping people of their self-respect. We're saying to people, you can't do it for yourself. You can't do it for yourself. You don't even give them a chance to try. In the 30s, my mother told me that in the 30s, what you, they called it relief then, you would whisper about the people who were on relief because it was a stigma. Oh, he's on relief. You know, and, and, and the minute they were able to go back to work, it was, it was, what are we doing? Are we not thinking about the value of human dignity? And this go, applies to Home Depot and how we treat our people. I, I told the story at lunch, let me tell it here. We used to own, we open stores on Thursdays typically because it's custom. On the weekends you run, a, you run flyers in a newspaper and people, so you open Thursday, the store is open. Tuesday night before an opening out in Long Island, I'm in the Elmont store and I'm walking through the store and there's a kid in the plumbing department. Now I have a special affinity, my old man was a plumber, so I, you know, plumbers in me, we got something going. And the kid says to me, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, uh, were you guys born stupid or did you become stupid after you were born? I said, probably a combination of the both. <laughs> and what are we doing stupid? And this is good. When a kid, when somebody who works not for you but with you, when somebody who works with you opens up, thank God you're going to hear things you may not want to hear and you're going to learn things you should hear and more importantly, you're going to do things better. Maybe not every idea is good. Well, this kid says to me, come over here. He takes me over the, the floor level, at the floor, where there's an opening about that high. First shelf is up there. We have a big box. In the box are plungers. Now, let me tell you about plungers. Plungers are a $4 item, a $5 item. We pay a buck, buck and a half for them. That's 65% margins, trust me. Those are huge margins. Problem is you don't have so many plungers. So the kid says to me, you go down here to get out of the box, you get dirty. I said, okay, well, what would you do different? He said, well, he said, you know, you go to a gun store, which we don't have in New York. You got them down here, but we haven't got, you know, we, we have all kinds of murders all over New York, but we haven't got guns. I mean, it's, it's magical how these bullets, where they come from, but they don't come from a gun. <laughs> so anyway, the kid says, I put pipe hooks on the side of the racking, and I put the plungers in like that. I said, okay, well, let's talk about the downside. You do that, and it doesn't work. What do you do? He said, all right, then I take them down, I put them back, okay. I said, so that's your risk, right. I said, so why don't you do it? He said, what do you mean, what am I doing? I said, you think it's gonna work? Give it a shot. He looked at me. Four days later on Saturday, I'm walking through the same store, and the kid grabs, come here, come here, come here, come here. And he shows me, the pipe racks are all empty. I said, oh, it didn't work, you put them back in a box? He said, no, we're out of plungers. You don't wake up in the morning and say to your husband or your boyfriend, hey, honey, let's go buy a plunger at Home Depot. That's not the, it's three o'clock in the morning, the toilet stopped up, you haven't got a plunger, and you say to your husband or whoever it is, get the hell out of here and get a plunger, we need a plunger. But it, it becomes an impulse item, when you see it, you haven't got one, you say, hey, honey, we don't have a plunger. The kid was right. But if that kid feels his career is imperiled by being blunt with me, shame on me. Shame on me. I, it's, you know, the, the worst word in the English language, in my opinion, is mister. It's an artificial barrier. Call me Ken. Call me a bad name if you want. I don't care what you call me. But mister implies I'm something you are not. And that's wrong. If I want the best you can offer, which is in your head, not your shoulders, not your arms, not your legs, in your head, then you have to feel that you're dealing in an environment where you can really, if you really have positive intentions, where you can really make a difference. That's the key. And we, we got 400,000 kids. They're cowboys, but guess what? They get it done. A kid, one day a kid's in the, this is, this is a wonderful story. A kid is in the electrical department and he's got his apron on and the customer comes in. Now the kid owns stock, remember everybody owns stock. And the customer says to the kid, 
excuse me, sir, is this your department? And the kid's, no, sir, he said, I'm in the plumbing department, but I own a whole store, what can I do to help you? <laughs> That's attitude. That's attitude. That's what wins. Don't you like, isn't it more fun being around people who you like than people that are a pain in the neck? Come on. Oh, what do I want? But that's what it's all about. One night I'm walking through the, the uh, uh, Jericho store in Long Island, and I'm in the plumbing department. I always end up in the plumbing department. And the two guys are arguing about hot water heaters. Well, one of the things about a hot water heater is called the recovery rate. In other words, how long does it take to replenish the hot water? And these two guys are arguing, and I'm, I said, excuse me, sir, I said, I don't know if I can answer your question, but what's your question? They said, well, we're talking about the recovery rate. So I start talking, and then I see out of the corner of my eye, I see a kid and I, with an apron on, do me a favor, young man. I said, will you give these fellows a hand? They've got some questions. He said, sure. So I'm wandering around the store. About a half an hour later, I'm in a completely different aisle, and the same kid is now with another guy from Home Depot with an apron on. I walk past them, but I'm close enough to hear the one kid, the kid that I got to help test it, say to that other kid, he said, you see that old bastard over there? He was trying to sell some guys a hot water heater. He know I was, and that's fine. <laughs> but that's the attitude you want. You want the biggest, most successful companies are the ones that encourage creativity and thought, and they're tough to manage. I make no bones about it. People that play by the book, yeah, they'll do exactly what you tell them, but nothing more. But these, when you can motivate and stimulate people to stick their neck out, good things happen. Not always, but typically good things happen. This is simple stuff. Really, it's, we're not talking about building a computer like Michael Dell did in his college room or Bill Gates coming up with a software program. I'm talking about simple stuff, selling plungers and hot water heaters. Okay, did I answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Let's go to Nick over there. Yes, sir. Well, that's why I wanted it. Because <laughs> if they wanted it, that means if I got it, I'm better than they are. And they had the reputations. That was one thing. Pressbridge was a, Bobby's here. We were a little railroad bond house. We traded railroad bonds and we did equipment trust certificate. We had never done that kind of equity before. Why I wanted it was when I met Perot the first time, I didn't know anything about him until I got down there that Wednesday. I sat with this guy and I said, oh my God. This guy, pardon me, is a second coming of Christ. This guy is good. And look at what he did. He was good, and he is good, and he did do good. I, people, it was people. There's an example of people. I didn't know what the hell he did in the computer room. I wouldn't know there were wires coming and going. And this, I, I, I didn't know. I, my last science course was eighth, eighth grade general science in the eighth grade. It was the people when I met Tom Marcus and Mitch Hart and Tom Walter and Davis Hamlin. It was like he had a cookie cutter and he was turning these people out. It, it was scary. It, it was all, yes, sir, go ahead. I understand why you want to do it, but why did you do it? And one decision, you didn't have the track Well, first of all, that's Ross's genius. That's his genius, not me, his the people he brought in to be with him. He hired kids, he didn't hire them from Yale, Harvard, and Princeton, he, got, he hired them from Texas A&M, or he hired them from uh, Arkansas State University. He, he, uh, I tell people, I, one of the great joys of my life, I spoke at Western Carolina University last October, I have a home in the mountains of Western North Carolina, and they asked me, they heard about the book. If I could have taken all 10,000 of those kids with me, we'd have built a thing. These, these are the kids I want. And I think, I think in me, in my candor with Ross, being perfectly blunt with him, what, I told, what he told me from all these highfalutin firms, and I said, pardon me, I'll say it as it was, that's a lot of bullshit. We went back and he's, what do you mean? Well, 13 hours we talked. You know, when you got, when you got to throw a Hail Mary pass, throw a Hail Mary pass. But I wanted it for one reason. I believed that this thing was one of a kind. 
and I wanted to be it. Arthur, uh, Bernie Marcus, I knew. There was nobody I knew in retail better than Bernie Marcus, and man, I wanted a piece of him. I'll go right down the list. It's always about the people. That's the genius of life, in my opinion, people. And I'm, I plead guilty, I'm a people junkie. My wife calls me that. She says, you know, I, I'll, hell, she says, Ken, I'll go to the opening of an envelope. I will, I mean, you know, uh, just you know, invite me and I'll come. Because somebody's gonna be there and I might meet him. <laughs> and I might like him, and I might want to do something with him. I'm making it sound simple, but believe it or not, as simple as it sounds, that's the way it was for me. Bindi Banker, we're talking about the biggest, oh, the guy would drive you nuts. But I can tell you right now, he'll outsell all of you together. Am I right, Bobby? This guy, don't ask me how he does it, but he was one of the greatest salesmen, and what he taught me, I couldn't believe. Okay, so this is a simple equation. There's nothing complicated about what I preach or what I believe, more important. Who else? Over here, yes, sir. Yankees, way to go. Are you a Yankee fan? Yes, sir. Okay, you from New York? Oh, well, that doesn't count. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Artificial intelligence, yeah. okay. Well, people say you shouldn't know too much. I think if I'm gonna hire you for a job, I wanna know as much as I possibly can about you to make sure you're the right person, and more importantly, you're the kind of person I wanna be in business with. AI is a magic set of letters. I'm not bothered by it, because my life's an open book, okay? The only people that should worry about AI are the people that have something to hide. That's about anything else, too. I mean, if you got something sorted in your past and you want to make sure it doesn't hurt you, pray to God nobody finds out about it. So I, I think, by the way, the, the, here's an interesting thing. Am I unreasonable to say to a person that wants a job from me, I'd like your resume? Oh, you went to Bucknell? Yes. Tell me what your grades were. Is that an unreasonable request, do you think? Okay. No, not unreasonable, right? So we had a man who ran for president of the United States who wouldn't tell you where he graduated from, what grades he got. I mean, think about it. He got away with it. Obama. Nobody, his, I love that Sarah, what the hell was her name, Huckabee? They wanted to know where Trump's tax returns were because he won't give them the tax returns. <laughs> Oh, they were in a very safe place. They're below Obama's transcripts of his hot records. Look, the more we know, I'm not interested in your personal life. I'm not interested in your sexual preferences. I'm not interested in anything at all like that. But anything that I have a right to know that's important for me to make a decision whether you should be with me or I should, with me, not for me, but with me, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Now, if we're gonna manipulate each other by playing with computers where you do things you don't know you're doing, but you're doing them because you're being manipulated with AI, that's scary. That's scary. Because that, what's that called? Brainwashing, I think. So, but it's here, it's here to stay. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, what? They're saying what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, there You're are. talking to peers. I heard that. Yeah, so it's like I'm talking to peers, and I, the main thing that's coming up is just before I get into the quality, I guess, is just like people are not like kind of satisfied with what they have. Bingo. The biggest challenge in America today, in my opinion, is income inequality. And I'm working on it as much as I can. I just had a meeting at the Ford Foundation with the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. We must address income inequality. Where did Venezuela go off the tracks? When the rich got so much richer than the poor, and Chavez was able to come in, or Castro in Cuba, and say, ha ha, look what they're doing to you. We've got to close the gap. But it's a two-headed monster. We're going to close the gap a lot quicker and a lot more effectively if we educate the people on that end. 
my way out of where I was was my mother's preaching to me, get an education and work hard. Now, I, I resisted education as much as I could, but what I'm saying to you is, it is a, it is a major, major problem that will destabilize America if we don't do something about it. Are you surprised to hear that from me? But no, what I'm saying is, you don't get any pushback from me because I agree with you. But the, but the moving parts need to all be fixed for it to work. If I got a clock and one piece of it over here is not working, the rest of the clock ain't going to work. Same is true. We must look. There's an incredible shortage of, of tradesmen in America today. A plumber in New York City makes $150,000 a year. What the hell are we doing making kids go to college that they aren't college material or, or they're not going to get anything yet? They work like hell. Okay, I did it. And nothing happens. Why not take that same kid, teach him to be a plumber or an electrician or a carpenter or a metal iron, iron, ornamental iron metal worker? They'll be happier. They'll do better. And they can be capitalists. You start out as a plumber. That's the reason why you can't become a plumbing contractor and have people working with you. That's the other. Remember what I said. Nobody works for you. Everybody works with you. Big difference in mindset. So you're right, but we're not going to address income in a quad. Public education, you want to fix public education? A good start? Start holding teachers accountable for minimum standards. How the hell can you rationalize a teacher, and this happens in New York City, who can't pass the test they give to their children? They're students. Square that with me. How do you figure that one out? I answer your question, or at least did I address it? Yes, sir. Just real quick on this, Ken. I sympathize with what you say, mm -hmm. but, but is that income inequality measurable in a system that rewards talent and skills? If you have different talents and teaching different skills, so eventually somebody's going to do better, and there's going to be inequality. Well, when I speak of income inequality, I mean it in the broadest sense. For example, this kid, Mike Trout, just got a $430 million contract for 13 years. Guess what? They, the Angels wouldn't pay me that. I can't hit a ball. I can't catch. I can't run. I mean, the guy's got the, the, this kid at Duke University, the Williams, is that the Zion, one? Yeah. yeah, let me tell you something right now. The NBA is going to pay that kid a fortune. Well, guess what? You watched him yesterday? There's no way in the world he isn't worthy of it. But you can't pay every kid that wage because they're not all that talented. Your point is well made. I'm talking in the broader sense where the people at the lower end of the economic spectrum, the gap is so wide. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, look, life ain't fair. We're not born, we're born equal as human beings, but in terms of skills and talents and ability, we're not. That's it. One last question? One last question. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so you speak about uh, being surrounded by the best people possible. So I'm wondering, what are the top traits to look for in a vitamin C female? All right. That, that's a great question. I'll let you in on a little secret of how I could get a great insight into somebody. I'd like to take a potential hiree to breakfast, to lunch and watch how they treat the waiter. I learned that when I was a caddy as a kid. The gentlemen were the ones that had bad shots and didn't blame me. The guys that were bums as golfers that couldn't hit the broadside of a bull's butt with a bass fiddle are screaming at me for their bad shot. I'm, I'm carrying it back, what the hell did I do? You know. I want to know about your ability to relate to people. God's greatest creation is people. I'm not a preacher. I'm spiritual. I'm very spiritual. But the greatest thing he's done for humanity is humanity. And I want to know as much as I can about a person and how they relate, how you motivate somebody, how you stimulate, how you encourage somebody, how you help somebody through a bad patch. Okay, and, and this is not business. This is people.
This is human relations. I've had people I've had to tell this business is not for them, different businesses. But I want to do it in a way that I leave them with their self-respect and I leave them with a promise that there's something better for them someplace else. I want them to feel like being told this was not the place for them was a positive for them. Because the worst thing is to keep them around for 20 years and they see all these other people coming and growing and promoting and they're still there. It's too late. One of the things I admired most about Jack Welch, the legendary chairman, I was on a GE board for six years. One of the things I admired the most when Jack let somebody go, when they walked out of his office, they felt like they'd just gotten a promotion. Think about that. There's no reason in the world why you can't be categoric and, and matter of fact. At the same time, you respect the human condition. The right for that person to have a sense of worth about themselves that's what it's all about. That's nothing more. If I picked up the phone and said to Alvaro, I want you to, the guy down in uh, Palm Beach, I want you to kill him, he, give it serious thought. Because Alvaro and I have a, in, in the book, I say to him, and I do it because I wanted to make the point, Alvaro es mi amigo. Because I wanted his friends who speak Spanish, he's Alvaro's from Colombia, I wanted them to know that there's something precious about Alvaro and me. So he works for me, he's my driver, but so what, he's a human being. He's precious. And anything I can do to help Alvaro believe that he is special, that's what I want to find in people. Where you elevate people, where you make people feel, look, the greatest leaders in the world do one thing. They get other people to do things they never thought they could do. When you motivate people to accomplishing things they never thought they had in them. Great coaches, that's Belichick, what's Belichick, Coach K, that's what they do. And, and so I can't stress enough the importance, the importance of respecting people and recognizing the importance of people in your life. I can't, okay? Thanks for having me. Don't shoot. Yeah, oh, you got one man over here in green. St. Patty's Day was only a week ago. Go ahead. <laughs> I just wondered uh, if you'd give us your views on the U.S. income tax structure, in particular, uh, a recent proposal from your friends in New York on the top right versus something like right. uh, the other side of the equation, the low flat tax. Look, look. Number one, I didn't bring this up, but I'm glad you did. It's an absolute disgrace for me to get a check every month from the government. As well as I've done in America, incredibly well as I've done in America, what the hell am I doing getting a check for $2,800 a month from the federal government? And my wife gets another $1,100. This is a travesty. I won, I won big. Here's an example of Washington. They haven't got the guts. Enti entitlements are 71% of the federal budget. You can mess around all you want with transportation, with defense, with all these other things, you won't move the needle. 71% is entitlements, and, and I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> I hear the nonsense from people about, well, I'm only getting my own money back, wait a minute. Get over that, get over that. You buy fire insurance on your house. The best thing that could happen is you don't put a claim and you didn't have a fire. The end of the year, you call the insurance company up and say, give me my premiums back, I didn't have a fire? No, you bought insurance. If there was a, the risk is theirs, not yours. This is the same with, with Social Security. Okay, back in the 30s, I understand that, but this is 80 years later. Taxes, I should pay more taxes. And I'll tell you, I'm not altruistic, but I'm passionate. I could leave New York tomorrow and move to Florida. I got a beautiful home in Florida. I could live there year round for more than six months and be free of New York taxes. What happens to New York if every guy like me that made it there, that did well there, once they did it, moved out? What about all the people that are left behind that can't afford to move out? What happens? So, 
flat tax, look, generally speaking, the more you can return money to the people and let the people spend their own money, the better it is for society and the better it is for the economy. We've proven that when we were at 90% one time, we took the tax rates down. Look at what happened. Texas, Texas is a perfect example. I think the greatest thing Texas has got for it is that the, the legislature only meets once every two years. That means every year you get a pass. They can't do something stupid. You only get it every other year. We got them up there in Albany forever. They're not, they don't just do it all the time. They're there, they live there, they sleep there. So taxes to me is something we have to address. And the first thing we have to do is to look at people like me and say, come on, you won, you won big. You don't need it, you shouldn't have it. But let me tell you what cowards they are in Washington. I know for a fact they tried to pass a bill where it would all, everybody alive today, nothing would change. People that were born after 2021, so they're not even, they haven't been conceived. The guy hasn't met the girl yet that's going to have the baby. It's two years. They wouldn't pass a law. They wouldn't make an amendment that doesn't affect one living person on this earth today. And what would the change be? Bump it two years. Actuarially, it's amazing what it does. Is somebody, am I right? You're, you're the statistics guy, right? Yeah, okay, I'm telling you, it's amazing. <laughs> this is all it takes. It takes a little bit of courage. That's why term limits will do it. Because when you know you're going home no matter what, it'll fix it. Now, maybe I'm wrong about term limits, but anyway, that's how I feel. I should not get Social Security. My wife should. By the way, what do we do with it? I, we give it to charity every month. I won't give it back to the government because they'll blow it. So, <laughs> no, I'm serious. That's why I give it to Ken's crew. My, my check every month, I endorse to Ken's crew. But it's a travesty. What the hell am I doing? Oh, come on. Thanks for having me. That's and, nice, Ken. Kind of